Today we're going to be working on the good old NES. Now, even though this thing is in fairly rough shape, it does actually work. The problem with this is I was less than impressed with the composite video output from it. So I thought, why not try some simple mods to see if we can improve that? So I think we can take it from this to this. And I think Mario will approve. So like I said, I want to try and keep this one simple. So all we're going to need is some basic soldering skills and a couple of little components and some simple tools. Obviously we'll need some solder, uh, we'll need something to remove solder, so either braid or a little desoldering pump. We're going to avoid using the desoldering gun because not everyone has one of those on hand. And we're just going to need a little bit of wire, a couple of resistors, a transistor and a little ceramic capacitor. We'll figure out the exact values later on, but this should be all that's required to upgrade our composite video output. And we're also going to do the expansion audio mod, which I'll explain a bit more about later in the video. Uh, I'm also going to be using an oscilloscope and this little video debug board, which is a creation of my own, but uh, you don't require either of those two things to perform this mod. I'll be using them in this video just to demonstrate what's actually going on with the video signals themselves, but don't worry if you do not have access to an oscilloscope, you won't need it to perform this mod yourself. So first things first, let's crack open the NES. So there's six Phillips head screws around the outside that we need to take out. There's nothing under this little expansion cover. Oh, well, I've always wondered what the expansion port was used for. Apparently it just houses spiders. We'll leave that off so we can give it a clean. Alrighty. So now I'm wondering if there's more creepy crawlies on the inside. Well, the lid doesn't look too bad. There's a little bit of spider web there, but that's fine. Eh, she's a little dusty around some of the ports, but all in all, not too bad so far. And because it's a Nintendo, there are another thousand screws to take out. Thankfully, they're all Phillips head, but uh, if you ever need to disassemble a Wii, uh, prepare yourself for screw hell. And with our screw collection quickly growing, we can now remove the top RF shield. There's two more screws we need to take out, which are the two front ones. You can leave the two rear ones in place. They're what holds the uh, cartridge loader mechanism in place. And these two screws are longer than all the rest, so you want to keep them separate. And with those all out, we can now finally lift this whole entire mechanism out. And we just need to unplug the little power connector, which is the blue one over the side here, and the two controller port connectors. They just all pull out. Well, it doesn't look like there's any more creepy crawlies in the bottom. Let's remove this bottom. Oh, there's one right there, um, but long dead. Let's see what's under this RF shield. Are there gonna be any more? No, that's it. I'll just put all this stuff aside. Uh, it's obviously gonna need a good clean and removal of spider remnants. And we're gonna focus on the board itself. And speaking of boards, I'd like to thank our channel sponsor, PCBWay. Yes, you can get high quality boards made by PCBWay for $5 for 10 pieces. They can also populate those boards with their PCB assembly service, and they do high quality CNC machining and 3D printing and a whole lot more. So thank you PCBWay for sponsoring this video. So what we're interested in is this RF modulator over here. All we need to do is pop the bottom of this can off, which should just lift off. And inside here is where we're gonna make most of our changes. There's no need to actually remove the RF modulator itself. Uh, it is held down pretty well to this main board and uh, removing it can be quite a pain. Thankfully, we won't have to do any of that to perform this mod. Now, one thing I would recommend doing before we go poking our fingers in here is to discharge this big 25 volt, 2200 microfarad capacitor. It's not gonna kill you, but uh, if you manage to short it out, it might put out a bit of a spark. So the easiest way to do this is just to bring the bottom half of the shell back over and we're just gonna plug in this power connector again. And I'm just gonna hit the power button. You may see a little flash on the red LED there and that's just that capacitor discharging. From what I can tell, there's no resistor to discharge this capacitor when it's off. So it will hold a charge for probably a number of days. So my original plan of attack was to just make some changes to the video circuit inside this RF modulator can, but I found that the NTSC versions, which do have schematics for the RF modulator, although they're not very good ones, and the PAL RF modulators are completely different. And as I want this to be compatible with both NTSC and PAL consoles, I decided to just bypass the video circuit in the RF modulator entirely. This will disable the original RF output, but when you've got decent composite, 
who needs RF? And uh, we can repurpose this for something else. So before we make any changes to the console itself, let's just establish a baseline. So we're gonna have a look at the oscilloscope and I'm gonna use my little debug board, plug composite video into here, and this will provide 75 ohm termination and also a convenient place to hook up an oscilloscope probe. So what I've done is use the 240p test suite for the NES to bring up the color bars and we're currently set to full brightness. And on the oscilloscope, we're looking at the waveform for one horizontal line of that video. So I've set up the cursors on the oscilloscope, the two white horizontal lines marked A, Y and B, Y, just so we can accurately measure the amplitude of the waveform or the peak to peak value. And if we look to the right hand side, you can see where it says delta Y, there is 1.231 volts. A normal composite signal should be one volt peak to peak for PAL systems, and I think it's like 986 millivolts for NTSC, so basically close enough to one volt. So what we really want to see there is one volt peak to peak, and we're seeing 1.23 volts. So the Nintendo is outputting a video signal that is a little bit hot, so to speak. One other thing we can see from the cursor measurements is the AY value. This is where that bottom horizontal line is and it's currently at 676 millivolts. Ideally you want the waveform to be around zero volts so there's no DC offset, but this is actually gonna work in our favor later on. So don't worry about that too much right now. The final issue that we can see is there is a little peak above the BY line on the left hand side. This is actually a bit of overshoot in the video signal. So on the left hand side of the screen, we've got our black border and then it quickly transitions to our full white. And as it does that, it actually goes a little bit over white and then comes back down to the correct white level. This is a big deal when we're drawing a few pixels of white together because that overshoot basically just gets clipped off. So you can't have whiter than white. This will become obvious, however, if you're going from say black to a medium level brightness or from white to a medium level brightness. You'll still get that overshoot and you'll be able to see it as either a darker or lighter shadow next to a certain object. Another way to see these effects is through a vertical stripe pattern. So again, this is in the 240p test suite. So you'll notice I haven't changed anything on the oscilloscope and we're seeing a whole bunch of peaks above that BY level, which is basically peak white. So in an ideal world, those peaks shouldn't be there. It should stop at that BY line. What I'm going to do is move the AY cursor up to where our black level would be. Now normally between peak black and peak white you should have 700 millivolts for a composite video signal. Because we're about 23% too high I'm going to add 23% to that figure and that should make peak black to peak white around 861 millivolts. So when we zoom in on that signal, we can see that black is more or less okay. There is a bit of a bounce at the bottom there, but definitely the white is overshooting and it's actually gonna get clipped at that BY line. Now, if this were a perfect video signal, our waveform would just look like a square wave, but uh, this is composite video and you know it does have a bandwidth limit. So we're never gonna get a perfect square wave looking signal out of this, but with any luck, some of the mods that we're about to do will hopefully get rid of some of that overshoot and also bring our overall video level down to the one volt peak to peak standard. So we can now disconnect all this stuff. Uh, the reason I like using this little breakout board rather than just hooking it up to a display like the Retro Tink over there is because if I make a mistake and send too much voltage or something down the composite video line, I'm only gonna damage something on this and not damage something in the Retro Tink 5X, which I may have already done, but I fixed that, so it's fine. That was my fault. So let's unplug this thing. And as I mentioned before, that big capacitor is still storing up a voltage. So I'm just gonna power cycle this thing. And you probably wouldn't have been able to see that, but the LED did come on for half a second. So like I said, rather than trying to make changes to the RF modulator itself, we're just gonna bypass most of the video circuitry and just basically pull it off the main board and design our own little video amplifier. So looking at the schematics, we can see that the PPU outputs a composite video signal, which then runs through a few other components and eventually heads to the RF modulator. What we're gonna do is lift the leg of this ferrite bead that heads towards the RF modulator, and that'll basically stop our video from going into the RF modulator itself. And from the lifted leg, we're gonna create our own video amplification circuit and send that directly to the RCA jack for the composite output. So this here is the signal connection that goes to the middle of the RCA jack and you can see there are a couple of other components sticking up through the board here. So we're pretty much just going to desolder these and push those leads back through the board so they're not making a connection anymore. 
So what I'm going to do is just add a bit of fresh solder to these little points. And there's also a little SMD component here. I'm just going to remove that by just heating it up at the side and it'll come off with the soldering iron. We'll try the solder sucker for this. So heat these up, suck away. Uh, the NTSC versions have a different layout for the RF modulator, as I mentioned. In fact, even the other Nintendo up here, which is also a PAL version, has different components in its RF modulator. So that's why I'm just going to bypass the whole thing, because uh, there's too many different variations out there. The RF modulator itself is just a single-sided board, so as long as you push these leads back through a little bit, that'll be enough. And of course, if you always want to revert these changes, you just need to open the top side of the can, which uh, is a bit of a challenge. You might actually need to desolder this thing and push those leads back through and resolder them. And as for the little SMD component, I'm just going to basically solder this just there. So it's still there. It's just not really connected to anything. It's just attached to that ground plane. If I ever need to revert this mod, I can just replace it back into its original spot. So now that we've isolated the RCA jack from everything else on the board, we're free to run our own signal to it. To build our video amplifier, I'm using a 2N2222 NPN transistor. You could probably also use a BC547 for this. Just keep in mind that the emitter and collector are reversed on the BC547, and I actually haven't tested this mod out with a BC547, but uh, I imagine it's going to be a very similar result to what you get with a 2N2222. The only other thing we need at this point is a 75 ohm resistor and a little bit of wire and perhaps some heat shrink. So I've just bent the legs out on this thing. So over here we've got our collector, that's the base and that's the emitter. If it was a BC547, it's the opposite. So that would be the collector, that would be the emitter, that's still the base. So all we need to do is connect the collector to five volts. The base is gonna to go to the ferrite bead that we lifted the leg of and the emitter is going to go through a 75 ohm resistor and the other side of the resistor is going to go to the RCA jack that we've now isolated. Now normally you'd want to properly bias the transistor using a couple of resistors going to 5 volts and ground but we don't have to worry about any of that because as we saw on the oscilloscope there's around a 700 millivolt DC offset already on that video signal which is kind of perfect for us as that'll get dropped in the diode junction in the transistor. That just helps to keep this mod nice and simple and also lower the component count that we need. So I'm going to place the transistor roughly in this position. So this is just going to connect to 5 volts. This just needs a little bit of wire to go from the base to the lifted leg of this ferrite bead. And the emitter just needs to go through our resistor to this point here on the RCA jack. Of course, I'll use a little bit of heat shrink to prevent any potential shorts. So I've trimmed the legs down just a little bit. Let's hook up this resistor to start with. This is where a set of helping hands certainly helps. We'll just tin this, tin our little resistor. So I'll just place that roughly in the position where it's gonna go and we need to cut off our resistor leg around here somewhere. That should do it. You could also use a cigarette lighter to shrink this stuff if you don't have a heat gun on hand or a hot air station. All right, let's get our random bit of wire. We'll just strip this and tin it up. Get a bit of solder on the base of our transistor and make sweet, sweet love. That should do it. We'll add a little bit more heat shrink to that. Now we should be able to solder this in place. So we've got our collector going to five volts. The resistor leg is going to go to the RCA jack and this wire is going to come out and eventually connect just there. 
add a bit of fresh solder to our 5 volt regulator output and a little bit on the collector. And it's going to go right about there. Nice. A little bit more solder over this side. Cool. That's secured in place. So I'm going to try and keep this bit of wire as short as possible because it will act like an aerial. So if it's too long, it's going to pick up all kinds of stray signals and you'll probably end up with jail bars in the image or something like that. So we're only going to use enough wire just to get to the leg of that ferrite bead. There's no need for any more than that. Let's go a little bit of heat shrink again. Tin that up. A little bit for our ferrite bead and make a connection. Oh, that's a bit messy. That's fine. So at this point we're about halfway there. We should now have a video signal that's around one volt peak to peak, but it's still gonna have a bit of that overshoot. We'll come back and deal with that in a second. Let's just first give this a quick test. So once again, I've brought up the color bars at full brightness and we are now seeing a total voltage of 991 millivolts according to the Delta Y figure. We can also see according to the AY figure, which is basically the bottom of our waveform, we have a 77.91 millivolt DC offset. I'd say that's close enough to zero volts and much better than the 700 millivolts that we had with the stock configuration. It also looks like that overshoot has disappeared, which is a good sign. Let's bring up the vertical lines, see what they look like. Right, there's the vertical lines. There might be a slight improvement there, uh, but definitely on the oscilloscope, things are looking a lot better. We don't have that overshoot anymore, but I think we can get a little bit better definition out of them still. And if we zoom in on that waveform, you can see that there is still quite a slope. So it's not the square wave that we're looking for, but like I said, this is composite video, so that ain't ever gonna happen. And going back to the title screen of Super Mario Brothers, things look a little bit cleaner. There's a little bit less noise in the bricks. Mario looks a little bit better defined, but I think we can still improve upon this. So let's continue. The last piece of this mod I'd consider optional and it's gonna involve a little bit of trial and error. If you're using something like a CRT, you may not see any benefit in doing this, but if you're using an upscaler like the RetroTink 5X, you may want to try this out. So what we're going to do is add a certain capacitance value between our video output and ground. And it's just going to knock out some of that high frequency noise and hopefully just sort of smooth out the transitions a little bit. So at the moment we're looking at level one on Super Mario Brothers and I've just zoomed into the bottom right corner. So let's start off with the highest value I've got here. This is a two nanofarad capacitor, and I think this is gonna really smooth out the image, probably a bit too much though. So I'm gonna touch one leg to our RCA output and the other leg just to ground. The RF can is a convenient place for that. And as I do that, you can hopefully see a lot of the noise disappears, especially if you're looking around the black border on the green bushes. Those sort of extra white pixels pretty much all disappear but in general, it does make everything look pretty soft. So two nanofarad might be a bit high. Let's try it with 1.5 nanofarad. Yeah, it's getting rid of that noise, but I think it's blurring everything just a little bit too much. Let's go down to one nanofarad. So with the one nanofarad, there's still a little bit of noise in there, but it's definitely not as blurry as the 1.5 nanofarad. So that might be the sweet spot. Let's just try 820 picofarads. So going smaller once again. That's not too bad. It gets rid of a little bit of noise. I think I prefer the one nanofarad. Let's zoom back out and see how it looks. So we'll try it with the 1.5 nanofarad, which did look a little bit blurry when we were really zoomed in. But zooming back out, it doesn't actually look too bad. Maybe the bricks look a little bit too soft at the bottom. Let's try the one nanofarad. Yeah, I think one nanofarad is the sweet spot. It tones down some of that noise and doesn't blur everything like the 1.5 nanofarad does. 
I'll just unplug power, make sure that capacitor is discharged, and we'll solder in our little one nanofarad capacitor between our video output and ground. So I'll just throw a bit of solder on this point right here, which looks like ground because it's connected to the outside of the RF can, and we'll stick our little cap right in there. If it doesn't try and run away. There we go, that's our smoothing capacitor installed. And there we go, that's our video mod complete. Now, if you've got the RetroTINK 5X, you can also change the filtering on here and squeeze out a little bit more video quality. So if I jump into SDTV decoder and change the Luma Chroma filter to notch, stop running away, Mario. It looks just a little bit cleaner and a little bit sharper. So let's refresh our memory of where we started and where we are now. And hopefully you'll agree that the simple little mod that we did was worth the effort. Now let's tackle the audio side. Before we put the cover back on the RF modulator, we're gonna do something with this RF output. Because it doesn't have the video signal running to it anymore, we may as well use it for something else. And it just so happens to have a white insert and the regular audio output has a red insert, so let's use it for audio. We're basically going to do the same thing we did with the video output and just remove any connections going to this jack. So it looks like there's one here and one here. So I've just desoldered them and then I'm just going to push the legs back through the board. Just like that. So this RCA jack is now disconnected from everything else. So all we need to do is run a wire from here over to here, and then we'll have mono audio on both channels. And I've kept this bit of wire long enough to run around the edge of the RF modulator, just so it doesn't pick up any stray interference. And that should be all we need to do in here. So let's throw the cover back on. We've improved our composite video output, and we now have dual mono audio output, which just makes things a little bit more convenient. Now, which way does this go? Just like that, we are done. So now I can plug composite video in, right channel audio and left channel audio. Cool, sounds good to me. Now some of you have probably heard about the stereo mod for the NES and are wondering why I didn't go that route. And to be honest, I've already tried out some of those mods and I was never truly impressed with them. At first it sounded really cool, but I soon realized that it sounded a little bit off as well. Not just because there's stereo separation between different channels, just because it seemed like certain frequencies were just missing. And also doing the stereo modification, no matter which way you do it, results in a much lower volume output. And the NES by itself outputs a pretty low volume level. And once you do the stereo mod, it's even lower. So personally, I don't recommend the stereo mod, at least not the ones that I've seen. I think the ideal stereo mod would probably involve amplifying the sound channels coming out of the CPU and then doing a slight little bit of mixing back together just so they're not panned hard left and hard right. But as it stands, the mods that I've tried reduce the volume level just way too much. I honestly don't think it's worth it, but that's just my opinion. But there is one more audio mod that I can recommend, but it's really only for people with an EverDrive and an NTSC system, and that's the Expansion Audio mod. You'll need the EverDrive in order to play the Japanese release games that came with Expansion Audio for the Famicom, and you'll need an NTSC system to run those games at the proper speed. If you try and do the same thing on a PAL system, you'll get graphical glitches, and everything will play about 20% slower. So it's not really worth doing on a PAL system, which is exactly what I've got here, but while we're here, let's do the mod anyway. 
So to do this we need to remove the cartridge slot, so we will have to take out these two remaining screws. And with those out, this top part of the cartridge slot should just slide forward. What we need to do is solder a resistor between pins 3 and 9 on this expansion slot. So this is pin 1 here, that's pin 2, that's pin 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Now most guys that I've seen recommend a 47k resistor. I'm actually going to go a 68k resistor. I did do some testing with 47k and the expansion audio was actually louder than the rest of the regular audio coming from the Nintendo. So I actually prefer a 68k resistor for this one, but you can always test this out for yourself and see what you prefer. So I'm going to go with 68k for this. So there we go, I've just tacked that in quick and dirty. Uh, I could have used heat shrink to cover up those pins, but as long as these legs aren't touching the pins in between, you'll be fine. Now I have seen one more recommendation for this mod, and that is to put a resistor between pin 3 and ground, just to try and get rid of any potential noise that's picked up by the expansion audio mod. Now I also tried a couple of different resistor values here, and to be honest I found that the difference in noise level is about 2 decibels, but when you're talking about minus 60 dB and minus 58 dB, there's not much of a difference down there. So I'm going to leave that resistor out. Personally I've had best results with a 3.9k resistor if you choose to put one in. Uh, some guides recommend something down to a 1k resistor and I found that has an effect on the actual expansion audio itself. So I don't recommend going down to 1k and I found 3.9k to be the sweet spot between reducing noise and leaving the expansion audio untouched. But um, like I said it's 2dB very low down so I don't even bother putting the resistor in. So in that case our expansion audio mod is done. So we better test this out, but like I said, NTSC games running on a power system doesn't work very well. It's going to run slow and it's probably going to have some graphical glitches, but let's load up Castlevania 3. So while it sounds cool, it is definitely running slow and um, yeah, the top of the screen is all messed up. So don't really recommend this mod for power systems because it's kind of pointless. If you're wondering what it's supposed to sound like, then this is the European version, which runs at the correct speed, but doesn't have the expansion audio. So I think that's about it for our NES video and audio upgrades, at least for the time being. Um, unfortunately, you know, with the stock system, we're still stuck with composite video, and that's always going to be a little bit shit, but uh, hopefully it's slightly less shit now. Of course, you could go an RGB mod, but I wanted to keep everything simple and easy for this video. The RGB mod is a little bit more involved, so um, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I'm going to continue doing some work on the NES because I'd really like to get an NTSC system, or at least hack a PAL system into an NTSC system, so I've got a couple of ideas for that, but that'll have to come up in the future. So I guess that'll give me the opportunity to clean up this case and remove any spider guts. But um, yeah, we'll have a look at NTSC conversions in another video. I think we've gone deep enough in this one. So um, that's it for now. Thank you all for watching. A huge thanks to the people that support the channel on Patreon. If you want to do the same links to that are down in the video description, you'll get ad-free early access to all videos. I'm going to get some cleaning done and I will hopefully catch you in the next one. Bye.